Water power swallowing, water bottle don't bother with it. Politicians, politics flowing like it's bottomless. Started it and finished it, water needed to swim in it. More valuable than oil, be careful homie, you spilling it. Welcome, welcome, beloved community. We are back again with yet another installment of the People's Water Board Coalition's Water Wednesdays webcast. Thanks, Nicole, and thanks, Valerie. Happy to be here. And so we're really, uh, really happy that you came on to talk to us about what was happening in Martin County. Um, we have, of course, here in Detroit, we know about water affordability issues and all about a water affordability crisis. So it was really important yeah. for us to talk to you. And since it's a short show, I'm gonna jump right in. Um, can you tell our listeners what happened in Martin County, Kentucky, and when the mistrust in the water system kind of began? Let's start there so people got sort of a basis of it. Yeah, sure, happy to. Um, so the mistrust in the water system goes back at least to the 1980s. Um, Martin County, and I'll just say, I. I I work in Whitesburg, Kentucky, which is which is about a couple of hours away, but I've been working with the folks in Martin County for about five years now. And the Martin County system was designed in 1968 for one town, for the county seat of Inez. And there were about 500 homes that were connected to the water system in the beginning. But then over the years, as people lost their wells for, because of mining or um, other problems, the system just got expanded out and expanded out until it served the whole county of 3,500 homes. Um, but they really didn't do a very good job of expanding it, and they weren't taking care of it um, as they were expanding it out. And then in 2000, something really terrible happened in the county, which was that there was a coal slurry impoundment that burst um, and flooded all of the creeks and the river in the county with just nasty, nasty coal waste. Um, the people throughout the county thought that the company or the government would come in and like help and and we have compensate the community and update the system, but that's not what happened at all. Um, basically, people in the county were told by EPA, by the state officials, Division of Water, um, and by the toxic um, disease registry folks that the water plant could take care of everything, that they can filter out the contaminants. There's nothing to worry about. Really abandoned. Yeah. Um, and then in 2002, so this is, you know, a couple of years later, the Kentucky Public Service Commission opened an investigation into the water system because there had been more scrutiny on the water system after this the slurry spill. Yeah. And it found that the water system was terribly out of compliance for a number of different things. And, and it ordered them to do about 45 things to, to fix the system. And then the Public Service Commission kind of went away. And then come... Four years later, 2006, they open up another investigation and see and see that none of those recommendations have been implemented. Um, it's criminal. And then, unfortunately, in 2016, they opened up a third investigation um, based on a complaint from one of the residents. They opened up a third investigation and again found that so many of the things that they had been telling them to do since 2002 had not been done. Complete in the meantime, negligence. Yeah, exactly. And then in the meantime, from 2002 to 2017, the residents, the customers of the system were getting quarterly reports on their bills showing that the system was in violation of disinfection byproducts and long term exposure to the water could cause a number of ki different kinds of cancer and neurological problems. So that was going on for, you know, 15 years, people were getting these notices. Um, and so, you know, that really, I mean, a, you know, people just didn't trust the system at all after that. And people in a very poor county were being forced to buy water, essentially. Um, it's, it's a county where no one really trusts the drinking water enough sure. to drink it. Um, and so that, you know, it, that is the point at which ACLC, my organization, got involved. Um and so we came in and started meeting with Martin County Concerned Citizens in 2017 about the investigation that the Public Service Commission was doing. And we were able to, um, the Martin County Concerned Citizens was able to intervene in that investigation um, and, and find out a lot more about 
how bad the problems were with the water system. Well, at the time that Martin County Concerned Citizens got involved in that third investigation, rates were $26.50 a month for water. Um, in 2018, just a few months later, the beginning January of 2018, the district filed for a 50% rate increase. And a 50 percent, you said 50? 50? Yeah, 50% at one time. Um, <sighs> and then basically the week after that, it was in the middle of January, very, very cold. The system nearly collapsed. Um, parts of the county were without water for two weeks in the middle of winter because they had so many, the pumps weren't working, the, the lines were broken. There was just, you know, massive failure in the system. And that was, you know, at the time that they were asking for a rate increase. That really focused everyone's intention even more on how bad, how badly managed the system had been and what bad shape it was in. Um, and so I guess the, the results of that, there ended up being two rate cases, one in 2018 and then another one in 2019. The results of that were that because the system, largely because the system was in such bad shape um, and had been financially mismanaged for so many, for so long, um, they got a basically an 84% rate increase. Um, the minimum water bill went from $26.50 to nearly $50. Um, and the minimum sewer bill went from $40 to $87. And that's, that's where it is now. Um, Martin County has the second highest water rates in the state of Kentucky, and, and it's a very poor county. And the people don't want to drink the water either. They have to pay for the water, but they can't drink the water. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's we saw that in Flint, right? To the highest. Yes. Flint had the highest. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can you talk about the water affordability study that you participated in, Mary, um, and tell us, you know, kind of what the findings were? Sure. So. Um, Appalachian Citizens Law Center, we have uh, a really great policy person who is a great data person also. And so we we pulled together all guys. of the water bills all across the state of Kentucky, looking at 233 different water systems and calculated the water burden for each system. Um, and we did that at different income levels. Like a lot of times when you talk about water burden, you're just talking about water burden for those at the median household income. But we looked at the water burden for um, lower incomes as well. And then we also looked at water burden for families using you know, different levels of water, 2,000 gallons per month, 4,000 gallons per month, or 6,000 gallons per month. And basically what we found is at in Kentucky, even at the median household income and 4,000 gallons per month, which is the average, so sort of the average of Kentucky, um, water is affordable, unaffordable in 50 of the census tracts. Um, but for those families that are in the lowest 20% income bracket, water is unaffordable for in 800 of the census tracts in Kentucky, and that's about 70% of the census tracts in, in the entire state. Um, so, so you have a statewide you know, water affordability crisis. Exactly, exactly. And the other piece of it is that it's not just we found that it's not just a function of income. It's water. The amount of water bills varies a lot across the state. And so there are people who are paying six to nine, six to nine times more um, than other people. Than in other systems in Kentucky. Some systems, the minimum bill is $13 a month. In other systems, the minimum bill is $77 a month. Um, so there's a huge variation in the amount of the water bill. Yeah. Um, and then we also found that even within systems, like in the bigger cities like Louisville, there's a lot of variation in the amount of water burden even within the system. And, you know, that the different variations sort of point to different possible solutions. Um, and so I think one of the, one of our big findings was, you know, this is not just uh, a factor of income and poverty, that it is also a factor of the amount of the bills. And so we feel like there needs to be a lot of focus on 
really digging in and finding out why are some systems, you know, why is why is a minimum water bill $77 a month in one place and $19 a month in another? What yeah. What's driving that difference? What inequities um, are driving it? Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Um, and we had a few, we have some recommendations uh, from our report. And one of them, and I know, I think you all have are people in Michigan have also been working on this. I'm not sure about the Detroit People's Water Board, but it's customer assistance funding. And it's really, it's a Band-Aid. Um, but we know in Kentucky that when there was LIWAP funding as part of the COVID relief package, it made a huge difference in yeah. many of the, the, especially the systems around here in Eastern Kentucky, um, where we have high bills and and very a lot of poverty. It made a huge difference. Um, so we're really, you know, that's one of our recommendations, and we're trying to, you know, work with groups to really push to get more LIWAP funding or some kind of customer assistance funding at the federal level. You know, we've been doing customer assistance at the federal level for energy for since the '80s. Yeah, um, seems like it's definitely you know, past time that we also be considering, uh, be doing it for water and wastewater. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're also pushing the state on trying to uh, be more accepting of, of rate structures that are income-based or um, more equitably uh, divvy out the, the cost. Yeah, you guys um, need an income-based water affordability plan that, um, yeah, and, and legislation. And that's been that's been a challenge for a number of years in Kentucky. So um, that's another of the things that you know we really feel like our report supports that. Um, and that the other thing is um, we're using it to really advocate for the uh, distribution of infrastructure funds to these disadvantaged communities, especially those with high water burdens. Yeah, that's. I mean. When we when we first started making, because um, we've got we just had legislation, a water affordability statewide water affordability legislation introduced here in Michigan. When we were looking mm -hmm. at it, it was kind of that was their main <laughs> argument for it was you know people who have access to these federal funds like LIWAP, you know they they're able to get they get a cushion they get a little bit of a cushion, but um, uh, of course that's not affordability. And so like right. being able to um, to need, have that cushion for people because it saves lives, there's no doubt about it, but have something in place um, that that protects everyone on the water system. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I will say um, we had worked with Roger Colton on um, he's our the homie. last rate case uh, and he's great. And one of the things he really stressed and it's absolutely true is, you know, this is, this is, there are two sides of this coin. If customers aren't able to pay their bills, then the water system doesn't have the revenue it needs to run. Mm -hmm. So these customer, the customer assistance funding is something that these water systems should really be, you know, advocating for also because it, it stabilizes their revenue. It makes yeah. it, you know, so that they're, they're getting the money that they need as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. And any water affordability plan that's, uh, put together, I'll have to do the same. Right, you know, right, Make exactly. sure that it, it keeps the system running, but you know, all of the, any kind of rate increases don't fall on the um, on the customers. That's right. it's so important because people are already stretched too thin and can't make their ends meet. And we see right. that everywhere. Um, it's certainly throughout Michigan. Um, it actually yes. kind of mirrors what, what you said, what's uh, going on in in Kentucky. It's yeah, a long fight absolutely. ahead to make sure that everybody has clean, safe, affordable water and that they're, you know, and then at some point in time, you need people to trust their water system, too. So getting earning that trust back is going to be such a big deal, especially mm -hmm. after all that they've been through mm -hmm. since 2000, which is a long time. It's 24 years. So by then it's your it's in your psyche, right? You just can't. Yeah, you can't trust the water. Right. I'll just say. One of the things, and I, I regret that Nina isn't able to be um, talking to us today. We want it. Nina, Nina McCoy is the uh, chairperson of the Martin County Concerned Citizens, and she's a great water warrior. But, you know, one of her things she wanted to talk about is how many problems they've been having with um, the infrastructure rebuild. So, you know, there was kind of a turning point in 2018 
um, where I think a lot of people in the state of Kentucky realized, oh, we've got to do something to address this situation in Martin County. It's getting a lot of scrutiny. Um, and, you know, the first thing is that about eight and a half million dollars in federal grant money was allocated to the system to rebuild key parts of the system, mainly the first was the raw water intake, the plant needed to be completely rehabbed, and then most of the distribution system just needs to be rebuilt. But so they've been working on it little by little. They've had so many problems with the engineers, with the contractors, um, with, you know, parts, things that were supposedly were fixed and then they're broken again. Um, it's, it's just been an ongoing saga where it seems that they're not able to really hold the um, the people who are doing the infrastructure projects to account in the way that they they should, and so yeah. that that has really had a negative impact again on on the community trust piece of it because they see oh you know eight million you know four and a half million dollars went to the raw water intake we still don't have a pump that works and it's part of mm-hmm. you it's got to be all hands on deck and mm-hmm. really uh, requires a dedicated effort from all levels yeah yeah because when people and when people can't trust their water infrastructure you know that's it's it takes away your whole quality of life right it really does it's one of those things and it's a you know it it really messes with your whole family's quality of life another part of the of part of it that is always so stark to me is that the corporations are the ones who trash the water and then they you got to buy the bottled water back from them it's like it's this vicious circle of polluting the water, ta- disinf- not taking care of the pipes, all of these things, and then then you're stuck with these with these monster corporations selling you bottled water that's really probably not a whole lot better than your other, actual water. We see yeah. that all the time. It's the the, the feeding into bottled water companies, yeah, the feeding the um, the beast of the water of the bottled water companies really really bothers me in these crises. Yeah, and I. And just the amount of waste yeah. um, that's involved with with bottled water also is is a, a big problem. And yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't know. It ends up how being long an environmental emergency too, right? Right, right. <laughs> because of the plastic. Right. But I don't know how long it will take before people in Martin County feel that the water is safe enough so that they're not having to buy bottled water. I mean, I think that's. I understand it. I understand it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. The pipes are still rotten in Flint. They haven't replaced all of them. And we, uh, and I'll just say, we were not able to take that into account in the affordability study. So our affordability numbers are, I mean, it's much more unaffordable when you consider the cost, obviously, of buying bottled water. Yeah. Yep. And having to transport it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we like when people got whole neighborhoods were shut off here in Detroit because they couldn't afford their water and having to carry water on a bus. Yeah, it's a mess. Yeah, no one should have to go through that, especially no. in this country with the wealth we have. No, there's no excuse. So are there any final thoughts, Mary, that, so, something that, um, and I do want to say that Nina McCoy was supposed to be on with us today, but she was having some tech issues. So I'm hoping that we do have her back on. Um, but are, are there any final thoughts uh, that people need to know Um And maybe even a website or places they could go to learn more? Sure. I mean, my final thought was going to be how much I wish that Nina had been able to be here. You know, Mm -hmm. I, I, and from that, I'll say like she and the people in the community are the ones who have really driven this. And it is so important to have community members who are engaged and speaking up and you know i'm i'm sort of outside i'm just i'm a lawyer that represents them i'm very lucky to be able to be doing environmental justice work as a lawyer um but you know i'm not living it every day That's and right. i know how hard or i can imagine how hard it is for people who are just trying to survive just trying to live it every day to make sure that they have water and then still go to the board meeting the water board meetings but that yeah has been the most important thing in Martin County is that there are people who are still speaking up and are still yeah. um, still organizing, still, you know, still speaking out on Facebook, still going to water board meetings, still asking questions. And I think if we don't, if you don't have that, 
these situations will never improve. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have the community um, raising their voices and uh, yeah. coming together. It's, yeah. you know, yeah, you got to have it. Yeah, and they don't pay attention to you. They'll completely lose, <laughs> ignore you and not pay attention to you unless you're doing it um, and, yeah. and doing it loudly in a, in a way, in an organized way when right. you guys are coming right. together. So important. Right. And also, I think these kind of dialogues are really important because we learn from each other. And, you know, like I'm really interested in hearing more about what you all were able to do through the state legislature so we can talk offline on that. But, you know, I yeah. think that we it's good to have, make the connection and also just to to learn from successes and failures and, you know, what other communities have been through. Well, we certainly can learn a lot from each other. I'm sure that we're um, that we're going to be friends after this. I just know it. <laughs> yeah, we're definitely going to. Um, uh, uh, see what we can do to help with your water struggle and always keep you um, abreast of ours and yeah. come together when we need to. That's, you know, that's the best part about um, meeting new people indeed. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Mary, for uh, coming on the show. And we missed you, Nina. We're going to have you back <laughs> on. <laughs> and um, yeah, we are. We're going to make sure that we have her um, back on and talk about her firsthand struggle and what, you know, what it looks like. Uh, but thank you for Mary, for taking the time today to be on our show. I know time is precious and for sharing this and we're going to share it everywhere to our listeners. Um, listen, try to take care of each other. It's hard times. Look out for each other and try to stay afloat. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Be careful, homie. You're spilling it.